feeling kind of sleepy. Does anybody feel sleepy? Oh, it's man. kind of a, you know, it, it's weird because we had Christmas and, you know, and all of the, anybody have a, you know, a good Christmas? I don't know, you open gift. Dave Sims probably loves Christmas more than anybody else. That's why we appreciate that. He was, yeah, yeah, really, really involved. But there could be a little bit of a Christmas letdown. Yes. You know, just a little bit of like, plus, I'm still digesting some of the food that I ate at Christmas. Oh, yeah, talked about this morning at Children's Church, this morning, Alan Thrasher did the children's church, he was talking about that, you know, that we need to be like uh, little children, you know, and he's talking about how little children are, you know, they're so, they're so dependent on their parents and they're so trusting, we started thinking about all those types of things, talking about little kids now, and then I started thinking about there's something else that little kids have, energy, <laughs> oh my gosh. They've still got energy on up, and they're running around. They're, uh, it's just amazing the energy that children have. Um, any of you familiar with the Energizer Bunny? Okay, do you find the Energizer Bunny inspirational or annoying? Annoying. <laughs> what? Inspirational. Inspirational. I kind of, you know, to me, the, the, the Energizer Bunny, that is one of the greatest achievements of advertising ever. You know, because he just keeps banging away. He's just happy. He's just, he's, just, he's just banging his drum. And he's all energized by what? What kind of batteries? Energizer batteries. I mean, that's perfect. There's a lot of commercials I think are funny, but that I can't remember what they're about. But the Energizer Bunny, he just keeps going and going and going. If you look at that, you think, oh, to have that kind of energy. Mother's coming in the back right there. Amy, would you make sure that Mother's waving me off? Everybody turn around and say hello, Mama. Hi, Nancy. Nancy's coming to church. Hi, Mama. Hello, Mother. Hello, baby. Marge. Yeah, that's how you get the attention. That's how you get the attention. Okay. Okay, well, let's just take a little, we're just going to take a little intermission while Mother gets to her seat. Well, I know, but you know she needs to she needs to be seated safely. Okay, I'm gonna tell a Christmas joke. I don't know a Christmas joke. Does anybody know a Christmas joke? Bob, you know a Christmas joke? Yeah. Bob, tell us a Christmas joke, please. You don't know Christmas. Anybody know a Christmas joke? What do you call a cat in the Sahara Desert? What do you call a cat in the Sahara Desert? Sandy Claus. Oh, thank you. You rescued. Yeah, you rescued. You had a rescue. It's a first grade. It is. It's a first grade. We're almost there. We're almost there. Let's give Mother a round of applause for getting to church. She worked. She worked hard to get to church this morning. I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> Yay! Good to see you, buddy. We were just talking about how the energy, and sometimes we run a little bit low on energy, and it's hard to and it's hard to get going. And it just so happens that there is there is an energy source that uh, that humans often uh, often go towards, and it's not necessarily positive. It's the energy of ego. Okay, that's the energy. Of, hey, look at me. Look what I'm doing. Thinking about myself, thinking about what other people think about me. Amy's got a friend who says, "Hey, let's not talk about you. Let's not talk about me anymore. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me?" <laughs> you know, and then, you know, just thinking about ourselves. And oh, if somebody maybe has been this or said something mean to us or something about like that, you know, just or, or does somebody like me or not like me? We can just start thinking about ourselves all the time. The ego can really get going, and that can give us kind of it's not necessarily positive energy. But it's the, it's the it's the energy of the of the kind of the ego driven life, and uh, the thing one of the reasons that I'm so grateful that I'm a preacher is that preachers never suffer from this. We just check our egos at the door before we come on stage and get over the lights and speak in front of people. Uh, but it turns out that that ego the ego 
is one of the most dangerous things that we have to deal with uh, when, as we grow spiritually. We need an awareness of ourselves, but if we get over aware of ourselves, then we start to move, we start to move backwards. We have to be aware of ourselves, but we have to sort of learn how to forget about ourselves as well as well. I remember one Christmas, oh, this is a Christmas story, Bonnie. Uh, they gave me, I was really good at popping a wheelie. Anybody ever do that? We've got any wheelie poppers in here? I was pretty good at popping a wheelie, and I could ride a wheelie, you know, pretty good, pretty good length. And so my parents gave me a unicycle. That's one continuous wheelie. Okay? So I would I would ride the unicycle. We had at our house on Tanglewood, we had a, a driveway, cement driveway, and then uh, there was a cement sidewalk that went around, and then we had a little cement walkway that went up to the house and then came back around. So it made a it made a place that I could I could ride. Well, I got to where I could ride my unicycle all the way to the end of the driveway. Wow. Yeah. But I tell you what, 10 feet on a, on a unicycle, that's once you get that in. Well, then I would get beyond the driveway and I would get to the sidewalk and then I would fall off because you know what I would think to myself? I've never ridden this far before. I've become very self aware. I've never gotten this far before and I, I, I fall off. Well, then I got to where I could ride there and I would go around the corner and I would go get around the corner and you know what I would do? I would fall off and I never got around the corner. I've never ridden the unicycle this far before, but I would, I would just get really, I would get over self-aware. And as soon as that clicked in, as soon as I just stopped thinking, stopped enjoying riding the unicycle, but stopped, started thinking about how I was doing on the unicycle, that was usually when it, I would have problems to fall off of. So there is a, there's the problem of, of self-awareness. We start to do something good, then we become aware of it. And we start to fall. We start to fall in some way. Anybody ever read the uh, the uh, the novel Catcher in the Rye? You've ever read that? You know that's an interesting novel. It's, it's one of the first kind of stream of consciousness novels. And you, if you read that novel, you get to spend some time in the head of a teenager named Holden Caulfield. And Holden is just figuring out life, and he's in the middle of a lot of teenage rebellion, and he's going through a lot of different. It's a lot, a lot of angst, a lot of different things, and he's very immature in some ways, but then every now and then, in the novel, Holden will just rip off something that's incredibly perceptive. And one of the things, uh, I saw a quote from this movie, that Holden reflects to himself at one point, if you do something good, then after a while, if you don't watch it, you start showing off, and then you're not as good anymore. So our text this morning is the chapter, we're, we're back in the Sermon on the Mount, and we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and then during Christmas we backed up. So we're at Matthew uh, chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 is where we're going to be, and if you, if you want to, uh, there's Bibles underneath the, uh, underneath the chairs, there should be, and uh, you can look that up, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 6. And so we're continuing on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. All right, so verse 1 there. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. If you do, you will have no reward. So if you practice your righteousness... Just to be seen by others, how much reward will you have? Zero. None. Now the, uh, the Greek word here, sometimes the Greek words, the, the New Testament was written um, in Greek. And sometimes the Greek words behind the English words are interesting. It says if you practice your righteousness, that Greek word for practice is the Greek word um, theathenos. If I'm pronouncing that rightly, but it has the act and I has the word theater in it. So if you if you're a theater, if you're if you're practicing your righteousness, if you're theatering your righteousness so that other people will see you, then you will have already received your reward. 
because you were doing it so other people would see you, and so you did it, and other people saw you, so guess what? That's your reward. You already received your reward. One of the, uh, the early church fathers named Chrysostom uh, thought that this whole problem was the primary spiritual problem that people had. They start doing spiritual things and they make some improvement and then they start thinking to themselves, look how good I am. And then they start looking and they start wanting other people to notice how good they're being or how spiritual they're being. And in so doing, they begin to surrender the very benefit of the spirituality that they're trying to practice. So Chrysostom, this is an old problem, a long time ago, he wrote, so the Lord first shuts out all intention of seeking glory, as he knows that this is of all fleshly vices the most dangerous to man. The servants of the devil are tormented by all kinds of vices, but the desire of glory, it is the desire of glory that, torment, that torments the servants of the Lord. So as soon as you start trying to follow Jesus, one of the things that you're going to want is recognition from other people seeing you do these things. And you're going to, you're, that's where you're going to want to get your energy is from other people telling you and observing to you uh, what a good job you're doing. And then if you're not careful, you'll just start performing for those people. That's the, that's the cycle that is being warned against. Verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites and hypocrites. That was a word. Jesus actually changed the meaning of that word. In the ancient world, if I said, you were a hypocrite, what would I be calling you? An actor. In that ancient world, that's what actor, a hypocrite was merely an actor. Of one, and they used to, uh, actors or hypocrites played multiple roles because they, they would put a mask on. And then they would they would do they could use different masks to play different roles in the same play. So a hypocrite was somebody who just put a mask on in a performance. But Jesus, when he said, "Don't be a hypocrite," that don't have a false spirituality. You're just acting out for other people. Now we now we associate a hypocrite as somebody who is who is putting on a false front. So so Jesus says, "When you give the needy, do not announce with trumpets as the hypocrites do." in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Why have they received their reward in full? Because they were doing it so other people would see them do it. So if other people saw them do it, and guess what? Done. Wrapped up. Okay. Verses 3 to 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Okay, so the idea is that when you start to do, let's say, let's say you're doing a good deed, when you're doing your good deed so that the Heavenly Father will uh, be pleased, you're performing for the Heavenly Father and for nobody else. You're not thinking about getting reward, uh, being observed by anybody else for doing this thing. When you think about this, then your Father who, see, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Notice it doesn't say, will reward you after you die. Will reward you. When my dog does something good, I reward it. How much more than will our Heavenly Father reward us for doing the kind of good that glorifies Him for His benefit? And what kind of reward will that be? Well, we all know that good feeling that you get when you have done something for, for the right reason and you feel, you feel the pleasure of your Heavenly Father if you, that's, that's how it's supposed to work. That's what's happening in prayer and in spirituality. We are living a God-infused life. The audience of our spiritual life is who? God. Do uh, you know who the audience for this worship service is? God. 
The people that are on stage leading worship are not performing for you. We are leading in worship, and so the idea is that we're all the, the, the worship is is to God. That is all. That is who we are intent on 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 pleasing. Continues on, verse five. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Of what value then is it if you if you're praying so that other people will see you pray? That doesn't have that doesn't. It, it could be the most beautiful prayer you could imagine. But if you're just doing that prayer so that other people will see you pray, then how much value does it have? So Jesus was very concerned that the spirituality in his day had become performative. People were performing their spirituality to be noticed and to be valued by others. And he said that is wrong. That what spirituality needs to be something that is more private. And so, verse 6, he says... But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So he doesn't just say, go into a room and pray. He says, go into the room and do what? Close the door. And why would you go into the room and close the door? So that nobody could see you. So that, that, that shuts off all, uh, all the performative aspect of it, right? Nobody's going to be able to see you doing this if you're in a room and you have closed the door. Then if you're in the room and you have closed the door, who is this between? The conversation is just between you and God, and that's it. Now, uh, let's just all pray that this is... <laughs>
And, and part of that time is for them to say things to God, but then a good part of that time is to listen for things from God. And then that sets their tone for the whole day. And then throughout the day, about every few hours, they, they do that again. Now, this person is a monk and lives in a community of people that are doing this. And so that would be easier. Uh, but just because we're not in a community of monks doesn't mean that we don't need to find some way of drawing close to God and having that kind of, of spirituality. I think worship is an important, it's important for us to come to worship on. Sunday, the worship is really an expression of thanksgiving for the relationship that we've been having throughout the week. Now Jesus, we can consider Jesus to be what's called a mystic, because a mystic is a person who lives in direct encounter with the divine. And if I think that the only way that I can have any communication with the divine is by reading a book something like that, then that's not mystical. A mystical, a person is mystical who they actually go into prayer and they actually believe that they are hearing from and receiving direction from God. Now this can be overdone a little bit, uh, but if there's not some way in which we can at least be saying to ourselves, to the best of my understanding, to the best of my ability, I sense, God, that you are directing me to do this good thing. And I want to do this uh, out of thankfulness. I want to do it for your glory. And that's what I want to do. And when I'm done doing that thing, I'm going to stop again. And I'm going to have another time of reflection. And I'm going to receive some more direction from you. If you think about a person going through the day like that, just, and they're not doing it to show off to anybody else, if they're just going through every day like that, that's a pretty powerful, that's a pretty powerful way to live. Verse 7, verses 7 and 8, we're, we're getting, uh, well, this is a little more than you asked for. I was at Matthew 6. Ah, it changed. Thank you, Ray. Uh, 1 through 8, yeah. It says, so and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So in other words, it's okay to just go ahead and ask for what you need to go ahead and do that part, but then you don't have to just keep going on and on and on and on and on and on. You can go ahead and stop, and then you can listen. And listening is listening is a little harder in a way. Because when you try to listen, the whole kind of all kinds of things will will rush in to that silence. But if you if you'll just let it calm down for a while, then in your way, you'll learn to have your own relationship with God, with your Heavenly Father. And once that's established, and once you live in that, then you will be uh, living the God-infused kingdom of God life that Jesus came to teach us about and to tell us about. So what this does is it takes us then to uh, Matthew 6, 1 through 8 is the prelude to the, the Lord's Prayer. Okay, you remember when we went through the Beatitudes, blessed are the, those of hundred, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed, all those, those Beatitudes that we went through, remember how dense they were? The Lord's Prayer is kind of like that too. It's short, but there's a lot packed into it. So, for the beginning of 2019, what we'll be doing is we'll be studying the Lord's Prayer together at a very slow pace, just going through it, and trying to get off, to get 2019 started off in, in centering prayer for each of us so that we will have a good year. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to get off to a good start in 2019. We may have become uh, distracted uh, from our prayer life. Uh, ironically, the holidays and Christmas can sometimes do that and just overwhelm us with so much to get done uh, that we kind of... Uh, and kind of lose our personal connection with you spiritually in the midst of all of it. So help us as we are coming into 2019 <coughs> to uh, be more 
more resolve to have that time of, of personal encounter with you as we start off our day and then as we go through our day, that we can feel the reward that comes when we're acting and living out of a, a truly uh, personal, uh, spiritual uh, connection that we are really feeling with you. Make these prayers, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we end our service uh, each Sunday with a closing circle. And uh, before, uh, for, well, when we get into that closing circle, if there's anybody that would like to join this church, I'll just ask at that time. And just to let me know that anybody that joins this church, all we ask is, do you believe in God? Do you, do you accept Jesus as your Savior? And then, beyond that, then you're just part of the fellowship. We all just continue to grow together and to learn together. Each one of us is unique and different. Uh, no two of us is going to have exactly the same kind of spiritual relationship with God, but, but that's okay. We all have a unique relationship with our own parents, and it's no different with God. And so now I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to Move into our communion time and ask for an elder to 